particular one is a 2015 LTZ, pretty much top of the line for them. That's a sharp looking pickup, as you can see. And it is kind of a show truck, because as you can see here, it's got the short bed on it. It's not a full size bed. It's more of a show off truck than anything else. Look at the rims. They're not made for going through mud. <laughs> but as you're gonna see here, you can already see the quality's kind of cheap. Okay, that's unlocked, that's locked, that's unlocked. But look, you pull on it, nothing happens. You gotta jerk around. It's just cheaply made tailgate. I can feel the plastic already coming apart. Five years old and the latch is starting to go. I know it's gonna snap off. I've fixed a bunch of these. Come on now, Chevy. This was a $43,000 truck when it was new. Cheap plastic crap on the handles, it's a truck. Come on. Now when we check under the hood, Got a nice V8 engine, which is 355 horsepower. But of course, all that power comes at a price on a big, heavy truck. This particular one gets about 15 miles a gallon in town, 1920 on a highway. Now, as we check the interior, comfy truck, lots of room. Turn the key in, yeah, it's still got a key, which I like. Starts right up, got all the electronic stuff, but it doesn't have that many miles on it. It's got 67,201 miles. And that small miles, it's got a big problem. Got the AC on low, but it's just got room temperature air coming out of it. It's losing the refrigerant, the customer filled it up and it lasted a few weeks and now it's blowing warm again. I made a whole video on this, you can watch it, but basically what I did was, I emptied it all out with my recycling machine, I filled it back up again, put leak dye in it. Normally you'll see where the leak has come with a dye, but it didn't show anything until I got my sniffing machine out. It smells refrigerant leaks. That's a normal beep. When it beeps fast, means there was refrigerant leak. But as you can see there, it checks for other gases too. I just ate a couple of tacos, and I guess they're all gassy from my mouth because it's beeping from that. But in this case, when I stuck it inside the AC dash, it started beeping, meaning that the evaporator inside the dash is leaking. Now it's bad enough that it's leaking. Due to their horrendous modern designs, this is a 50 hour job tearing the whole dash apart to replace it. It's well over with parts and labor and everything, a $2,000 job on a vehicle that's just barely five years old. It's got 60,000 miles on it. To me, that's uncalled for. That is just poor manufacturing by GM. Like I've been saying, they don't make the greatest stuff anymore. Now it's bad enough that it's leaking, but in the olden days, the GM trucks, they had the evaporator here under the hood. I could change an evaporator out in about an hour. Not 14, 15 hours, one hour. But they decided to move it all inside. So you gotta take the whole dash apart. And like I say, it's a 14, 15 hour labor job. And the cost of labor, the cost of parts, it'd be around 2,000 bucks to fix the stupid leak on something that shouldn't have leaked that fast. Again, here's my 94 Celica, 240,000 miles, old as the hill, still got the original evaporator, and still blows freezing cold. GM, Quality, it's not there anymore. Now this baby's got all the creature comforts. It's got heated and cooled electric seats. And when you go in the back, you can see the back seat isn't a joke. It's got a lot of space to sit in. A nice little area to put stuff in. Cheaper quality and design. They didn't even have air conditioning system blown out here like the Toyota Sequoia I showed the other day. You just get in the air from the front. They could have easily put vents in here, but I guess that would have cost them too much, or maybe they couldn't figure out how to do it. More interested in having an armrest that's got cup holders in it. Now you're not going to get stuck with this thing, because you can see here's the front end, and there's the drive shaft on the right side. You're not going to get stuck. In the back, it's got a big beefy rear end here. Got to put oversized shocks on it. Got a big old spare tire under here. You know, it's a solid built truck. No arguing that. And as I say, when you climb inside, plenty comfy. It's a nice comfy big truck. Traction control on or off, and you can adjust the pedals and stuff. You know, it's got a lot of creature comforts. There's no arguing that. So let's start it off, take it for a spin. Got the obligatory backup camera. Now it's got decent cornering for a big old pickup truck. We're not gonna have to wait for this guy who rudely pulled out in front of us. Isn't that typical these days? It's got some pickup. Big old engine. Hey, it rides like a typical pickup truck, you know. You're gonna feel bumps. They're sloshed out by the weight and everything. But you see, when we get these bumps, it rumbles around. It's a pickup truck. It's not a Lexus or a Cadillac, you know. It's a pickup truck. But for a pickup truck, really, 
got a pretty smooth ride. Gump enough when you're going straight and not hitting any big bumps. And if you're used to driving land yachts around like I did when I was a young kid, you kind of point and steer, you know? It's not the crispest of steering, but you know, it's a big old truck. That's what it's gonna act like. And like I said, it's got a pretty cavernous back seat, you know? Climb inside. It's not particularly cramped. This isn't a tiny little back seat. It's got plenty of room. But I do have to say, for almost fifty thousand dollars, and this thing already needs two thousand dollars plus of air conditioning work on it, the quality just isn't there. Okay, here we have the brand new Toyota Tundra with the V6 turbo instead of the V8 engine. I'm gonna tell you the truth about it. It's not a demo. Toyota didn't give it to me. No, he loves the look of the truck. It's the full-size Toyota truck. And he got the TRD 4x4 off-road. Beautiful wheels. He's got a lot of water in here. The man's thirsty. <laughs> That's because he runs a barbecue. See all that charcoal? He uses that stuff up. Now everybody knows throughout history the Tundras have been insanely long-lasting trucks, but this is a, kind of a controversial one because it doesn't have the V8 under the hood. As you take off the goofy top, you can see it's a twin turbo. It's got a turbo on each side, and it puts out 389 horsepower. So that's eight horsepower more than the V8 that it replaced. And in terms of torque, the V8 has 401 pound-feet of torque, but this V6 has 479 pound-feet of torque. It's got more torque. On paper, seems like it's got a lot of power. The biggest problem the Tundras always had were, they were gas hawks. Now you take my grandson's Tundra. It's the 5.7 liter V8 engine. If he drives it normal, he gets about 10 miles a gallon. So far, the owner of this gets 14 to 15 miles a gallon. It's average to get somewhat higher, but of course, a lot of times those are fantasy figures. Now this is four wheel drive and it's rated at overall 21. He's getting between 14 and 15. That's quite a big difference. Now it's better than the 10. Yes, still not great, but it's a big truck. What do you expect? It's got all kinds of technology in it with Toyota's new engine systems. Now I do have to say Toyota engineers are pretty good. As you can see here, you've got coolant for the engine, engine, but also coolant for the intercooler for the turbo. It's more efficient. You can't expect about 15 miles a gallon. It was rated at 21, so that's kind of a disappointment. And that's not with him towing a bunch of stuff either. Now he does have a gigantic trailer that he brings his taco business on when he goes to special events. I can't wait to see what kind of gas mileage he gets when he tows that with this. That'll be interesting. He hasn't done that yet, so I can't give those figures out. But normal driving 15 is a lot lower than the rated 21. Now I've seen some of these V6 engines from Toyota make noise. They didn't build them right. But this one, let's listen to it. That's a cold start up and really, once it warms up off the cold start, it makes a little noise. Nothing outrageous, but even sitting here, it makes quite a bit more noise than the V8s did. Not as quiet. Mind you, that's with the hood open. And really now, you don't hear anything at all. Now it's a V6, but it's not going to be shaky probably at all. As you can see, it's not shaking at all. And he's been driving it conservatively, and you can see here, He's getting 14 and a half miles a gallon here, which is an average, but that's well below. They rated at 21 miles a gallon. So don't be fooled by a lot of these figures. Now, when it came to price, he paid less price. They did not mark it up. I've seen people mark these things up a ton. He said he saw one at Carvana. They wanted 75 grand for it. And his cash price, as you can see, was 6194 that's a real price that's not you know the lowest end vehicle where they advertise oh it's only thirty nine thousand dollars forget all that crap you want a nice truck and i do have to say the hopkinsville toyota dealers were fair with him because this only had cloth seats and he didn't like it so they put leather seats and everything in and they didn't charge him anything extra for it most places they're going to hit you for everything but then again, it's Hopkinsville, Kentucky. You get in more rural areas, generally the dealers will treat you better because they've got a smaller market. In the big city, they can rip everybody off. But in smaller places, if they get a bad reputation, that's going to be it for their business. So a lot of times it pays to go out. I remember people in Houston, they used to drive way up north of town, go to Conroe, Texas, buy vehicles there, and they'd save thousands. Now you can see it's got an excellent backup camera. It flickers because I'm shooting it with a camera, but it doesn't flicker for your eyes. You can turn the traction control on or off. Look at the space in the back. There's a lot of room in these things. And it's all electronic four-wheel drive, so you can go two-wheel high, four-wheel high, four-wheel low. That's it. 
we are talking really simple and the dash tells you what's happening if you forget gee I wonder if I'm in four high or I wonder if I'm in four low or I wonder if I'm just two-wheel drive of course it's got various drive modes normal tow mountains crawl if you want to do some rock crawling and check out the center console man there's all kinds of room and there's also all kinds of charging and this isn't just some basic rear window here check it out not just a little piece the whole window opens up and then closes not just the slide much more impressive I'm not a fan favorite for me but you got no choice got electric parking brake that's just how they're all going you'll hear that if you idle too long you don't want to damage the car so it warns you if you idle for an hour to shut itself off you can bypass it by pushing a button too but not a bad idea turbos aren't made for just sitting and idling forever this is a brand new truck as you can see it's only got 597 miles on it he has had no problems yet now the early ones had problems with turbochargers right but this is a brand brand new one he just got it. it's got 597 miles We'll see if Toyota has fixed those problems as time goes on. He lives three blocks down the street, and I eat at his taco stand all the time, so I'd keep asking him, okay, what's happening? Are you having any problems with it? I'm assuming Toyota fixed that problem. We'll find out over time, and if it does, believe me, he'll tell me, and I will tell everyone else. So let's take it for a spin. Now, it's a big truck, high up in the air. does have a smooth ride, smooth shifting. You certainly feel like a king of the road driving this thing around. Crisp handling for a pickup truck. We'll take it out to our little drag strip here. And we'll see what this 389 horsepower can do on a straight road and normal driving. Here we go. The turbos are kicking in. It's got plenty of acceleration. Although I do have to say the shifts, they weren't that smooth. A lot of people complain about that. They want to get the best gas mileage possible, but to me, it wasn't crisp enough. Now you can of course shift it yourself, okay? We'll put it down a couple gears. We'll put it in third gear. Step on it. That's quite a bit better. So really, if you want to drive like a maniac, shift it manually. As you can see, we're now in 10th gear. You got 10 gears you can mess with, up or down. So realizing it's got a 10 speed transmission, but it's still only averaging 21. To me, that's kind of a disappointment because I've driven big Fords that had 10 speed transmissions. They got in the upper 20s, some of them. So mind you, it is a Toyota. It'll probably last forever if you take care of it. I still like the V8s better, the grunt the noise the acceleration this may have twin turbos but with that 10 speed transmission the old 57 v8s had more pickup and that just shows you that torque rating can be misleading because this has quite a bit more torque than the v8 but it doesn't feel that way customer just told me this ram these stupid semi keyless remotes dumbest system ever vehicle won't start so what are we gonna do? Well, let's start by turning the key and seeing what happens. Stick the key in. Well, the lights come on, so at least we turn the key off, turn the key on. There's power there, but when we turn the key, nothing. That is a doornail. So with the key on, let's turn the headlights on, go outside, see what happens. Well, the headlights are coming on, so there's power going through the system, but you never know how much power the battery has, so let's open hood and check it. Typical Dodge, the hood won't even stay up. They make them like such pieces of crap. <laughs> So we need a stick. So it tests the battery. And since it says right here, 790 cold cranking amps, we'll check that. It's in the vehicle. Battery, top post, regular, cold cranking, and we'll put it on 790. Then we push start. We'll see what it says. State of health is not that great. It says it needs a recharge, but that isn't gonna be why it's not starting. It needs recharging, but it's got enough. Should crank the engine. It's not doing anything. So something's wrong between the battery and the ignition switch going to the starter. Odds are it's this system. There's such pieces of crap. God knows Chrysler has enough problems building cars that it is to add this stuff onto it to make it another level of crap that breaks on them. So I'll hook up my fancy scan tool and pray it finds something wrong with the system with a code so we don't have to check absolutely everything on this pile of junk. So I'll plug it in under the dash and pray. At least it read the vehicle. Now we can see if it shows anything wrong. Typical Dodge, it already shows that there are eight 
eight volts in the powertrain control module. We'll see what codes exist there in the PCM. Whole bunch of them. Cylinder one misfire. EVAP purge. That's not it. That's not it. Brake pressure sensor. Incompatible. <laughs> Implausible. Oil pressure out of range. None of those are really starting problems. I'm going to try a trick. I'm going to erase all the codes. This machine can erase all the codes on it. See if that's going to help at all. Sometimes, strangely enough, it does. Now they're all erased, then I'm going to try another trick. We're going to remove the battery terminals. Then with the remove, we're going to touch them together to reset everything, drain everything. Then leave them off for about five minutes. That way, it can reset everything. Back to factory settings to some extent. Sometimes it'll start right up then, let's see. All right, we'll put them back on. First the negative, and tighten it up, and the positive. That's nice and tight. Now we'll see what happens. Well, sad but true, stupid thing still isn't gonna start. So, we know we turn the key on, we're getting power. I'm gonna hot wire the starter. See if it'll start then. Now it's pretty easy on that. You get in on the driver's side, crawl under, Right under here is the starter, and somebody's already gotten a wire frayed here so you can check it. We will put a jumper cable right here on the starter line. Then reach under here and fish the line up. Got to be a truck that's way up in the air, and I'm not 80 feet tall here, so bear with me as I grab the stupid thing. Here's the wire. Now, if we put it on a positive cable, it should make the starter at least turn over. Nothing. Probably a bad starter. And here's a good test. That's connected. Then we get a big hammer and go back under the vehicle. And give it a few whacks. Well, it's not starting, but that doesn't mean it's not the problem. We didn't get lucky on this. A lot of times, the starter still has some life left when you whack it with power going to it. The stupid thing will at least start to crank over. In this case, it's not even doing that. So we're going to have to pull the starter off and then check it in the air to see if it works at all. So we'll take the battery terminal off so we don't shorten anything off when we remove the starter. Then crawl back under and unbolt the starter and take the power lines off here. And off comes the starter. And there's Dodge for you. This tiny little starter for this huge chummy engine and I can smell it it's burnout I don't even have to test it. it's hot now and I can smell it's just burnout cheap starter on a big engine and here's the replacement tiny starter that's all they had to fit on the stupid thing at least locally if you really want to do a better job you can try to find a racing starter that's a lot better than this piece of crap but this is just the guy's work truck so I'm just putting the same thing back on so it just slides back in the hole and you put the two bolts in the bottom and the top get them on nice and tight and don't forget to do the top one too there are two of them holding it in and you get the big power cable and Put it on, the nut on top of it, and tighten that up. Then get the starter wire here, and that just plugs right on there. Snaps right on, nice and tight. And don't forget to put the battery cable back on, and put it on nice and tight. There we go. Then let's pray it didn't short the computer out. Even the computer on this thing has to do with starting the car, and sometimes I see if the starter shorts out, it can fry the computer. So let's pray it didn't. Well, here goes nothing. <laughs> As you can see when I scan it, it has a bunch of other things wrong, but typical Dodge. He wants this thing to start. Now it's starting and I'm stopping right there. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.